Okay, great. We're going to start with the next panel is Conquering Challenges at the Intersection of Neuroimaging and Neuroimmunology. Okay, uh, so I'm Harry Sontheimer. I'm privileged to uh, moderate this panel, and I want to start out by telling you all just how excited I am to be at UVA. And, uh, you know, I don't think I've ever been at a place, and I've been many places, that's as collegial as, as, as UVA is. And we all expected this to be a shark tank. I guess that's why we have the glass in front of us. Um, <laughs> But the problem is there's no sharks here in the neuroscience community. And in fact, what we've seen is just a, a wonderful display of collegiality, of sharing of ideas, and really of a lot of synergism uh, being presented. And so hopefully we can expand that uh, with the next panel here. So um, I have the privilege to uh, moderate a panel that brings together two very exciting areas of neuroscience, namely neuroimmunology and neuroimaging, and the overarching idea is could we harness the immune system to treat neurological illnesses? And just as a reminder, neurological illnesses collectively are the second leading cause of death worldwide. It's the leading cause of daily disability-adjusted life years lost. So it's an immense problem. And of course, there's the usual players, Alzheimer's disease. We heard about development, autism. But there is an emerging player, COVID, We've just learned in the last month or so from publications that up to 25% of individuals who've suffered from COVID have neurological comorbidities. So we have yet to find out how this is gonna affect the developing nervous system or the adult nervous system you know, from here on to come. So to get an understanding of just how one might harness the immune system to treat neurological illnesses, um, I'm going to turn this over to Taji Harris. She's the director of the Brain Immunology in Glia Center here at, at, at UVA. And she's going to explain to us what neuroimmunology is. Thanks, Harry. So um, it's just a pleasure to be here. And so I'm going to take a few minutes just to sort of set the stage. What is neuroimmunology? And how did we get here? So what we know is that from studies that were performed in the 1920s to the 1940s, there was this concept that emerged that the immune system and the central nervous system just don't interface, right? And so these early studies were foundational. They, they provided a context, but they basically said that the way that immune responses can respond in the brain is just very slow. It's very different, right? And so these interactions weren't studied for years. So neuroimmunology is just a recently emerging field. It's multifaceted, but for the most part, it's people trying to really understand how the immune system and the brain do interact. So in the intervening time after those first studies that termed the brain as immune privileged, we started to have more and more emerging evidence that the immune system was showing up in the brain in neurological diseases. So MS is one of these diseases where we do know that the immune system is actually causing a lot of damage to the brain. And if we do target the immune system, uh, we can have fairly good success in treating MS. So basically, we started to just have mounting evidence that, yes, the immune system's turning up in, in neurological disease. Well, what is it doing? Is it good or is it bad? This is what we always keep coming back to. Is it playing a role in potentiating disease, or do we need the immune system to function to protect the brain? And so I'm just going to uh, put out a few things that make the immune system functioning in the brain very different from other places as well. So this is what we've learned uh, in the really in the last 20 years or so, as neuroimmunology has become a really, really um, exciting and emerging topic. So one of the things that's unique about the brain is that the immune system is very mobile. The immune system can traffic through the blood, hit all of the organs, but it doesn't enter the brain. So the immune cells that we do have in the brain are microglia, and they're seeding very, very, very early in development, but then stay in the brain. There really are the, the one cell type we can rely on to be in the brain to take care of it. And so basically, we don't have the ability of all of the other immune cells to contribute to the normal function of the brain at all times. One of the reasons is because we have the blood-brain barrier, and that'll keep coming up. So this is a physical barrier that restricts the flow of immune cells going um, basically into the brain. And so it takes quite a lot of conditions in order to get these immune cells to come into the brain, but we know they do come in. And when they come in, they can either uh, protect the brain and be really important for healing, or they can be detrimental. Another interesting facet of the brain that sort of helps to um, 
classify it as immune privilege is the lack of lymphatics. So when we think about lymphatics in every other tissue, what they do is they're sort of the outdoor. And it's the way for any organ to sort of say, this is what's going on, and then share it with the immune system. The lymphatics are the outdoor. And for many, many years, it was said, yeah, the brain does not have any lymphatics. And then in 2015, here at UVA, we did describe that, yes, there, there are lymphatics in the brain. But what we come to realize after this groundbreaking discovery is that these lymphatics are still very different. They're not in the deep tissue. They're very much on the surface of the brain. So we still have so much to learn about what these lymphatics do, how they contribute to disease, but at least we know they're there now. So we have some context as to how the immune system does function in the brain. It is just so different than every other tissue. We've got so much to learn, and the immune system keeps showing up um, in the central nervous system. So I'm just going to introduce uh, the Brain Immunology and Glia Center, which I direct. And so this is where the fascinating discovery of the, the brain lymphatics happened. Uh, the center was founded in 2012. This is when neuroimmunology was very much an emerging topic. We were one of the first centers in the United States to form. And we'll be ce celebrating our 10th anniversary next year. And so what BIG is, is it's just a collection of faculty with common research interests. So it's taking people from across grounds, different schools, that think about similar topics. But we all have really, really diverse training and expertise. And so it's really been this uh, cross-pollination of people that are experts either in immunology or neuroscience or biochemistry or, or chemistry, right? So that come together and sort of say, this is the problem. This is how I think about it. And we've been able to share reagents and ideas, and it's been incredible for generating discovery. And so that's the goal of the Big Center, is to continue to uh, train the next generation of scientists. We just had an NIH uh, T32 program funded that's going to support our trainees to specifically study neuroimmunology. And we're gonna continue to make those discoveries well, Taji is one of the early players in this field, godmother, if I, I might say. What, what gets you personally excited about this field? Yeah, so um, it's been amazing to see this field flourish and grow. Um, so I've been faculty at UVA since 2013, and the meeting attendance for anything you know, surrounding neuroimmunology, the new meetings that are emerging, the new people that have come to the field, so a lot of our immunology colleagues are becoming neuroimmunologists, a lot of neuroscientists are saying, I want to I want to learn more about neuroimmunology. That's been exciting. As has the sort of what we're finding about the genetics of neurological disease at the same time. So as we're finding all of these genes that are connected to neurological disease, they're mapping to the immune system. So this is giving us more and more clues that yes, the immune system could play a very central role in the development of disease or is necessary to protect from disease. And so what I'm so excited about is that we seem to be very close to having some therapies for these diseases that are so hard to treat. Well, that's very exciting. So um, imaging, uh, fortunately we have Fred Epstein with us, the chair of biomedical engineering, who's been using imaging technologies throughout his career to tell us about neuroimaging. Fred? Yeah, thanks, Harry. First, by way of disclosure, I think I'm the only person on any of the panels who's not a neuroscientist, although I did image the brain in about 1992 a couple of times when I was a PhD student. But anyway, I do know a little bit about imaging, so I'm happy to talk to you about that. <clears throat> so I'll direct your attention to the monitors because for imaging, it's generally important to look at the pictures. So when we think about brain imaging, probably the first thing we think about that it's really a mainstay of diagnostic radiology. That's, the, that's where it's used most often. And the pictures that you're looking at are demonstrating that UVA investigators, so people here at UVA have made major contributions to the point where it's no exaggeration to say that if you or anyone you know ever had a brain MRI done, it's likely that technology invented at UVA was involved with that scan. And in fact, I'll embarrass John Mugler because most of those inventions were invented by John. And he's here back there. Okay, next slide, please. So while imaging brain anatomy is the first thing we think of, imaging scientists have invented lots of other things that can be detected and probed by imaging. Maybe that's blood flow to the brain. Maybe it's inflammation. The example that I'm showing here is connectivity. So you heard prior panelists talk about brain circuits. 
Well, imaging, whether it's optical imaging, magnetic resonance imaging, or some other techniques, can image connectivity, what's connected to what in the brain. And we can do, can do that across scales. So the images on the very left are showing connectivity of neurons at a cellular or even subcellular level with 100 nanometer or maybe one micron resolution. And other images shown there, for example, magnetic resonance images using what's called diffusion tensor imaging are showing connectivity across the whole brain. So this is one example of a parameter other than anatomy that can be, uh, that can be assessed by imaging. As I mentioned, blood flow, inflammation, brain function are other parameters that can be, that can be detected by imaging and measured. And this can happen uh, not only uh, for um, diagnostic radiology, but this can also be applied, and you'll see examples from AO later on, in the field of discovery biology. So imaging plays a role not only in diagnostic imaging, but also in discovery biology and the translation of discovery biology to clinical uh, decision making. And so this slide shows two important ideas. One, Taji mentioned the blood-brain barrier. One of the things that UVA is fantastic at is using focused ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier to deliver therapy. And this shows an example, the yellow arrows on the left images show MRI of the brain prior to opening the blood-brain barrier. And you can see you don't really see anything in particular. In the middle set of in the middle image, you can see a bright area pointed to by the yellow arrow. And so that is showing the injection of a contrast agent that makes the image bright in that region. Well, the contrast agent only gets through the blood-brain barrier in the region where focused ultrasound opened the blood-brain barrier. So we can visualize very clearly where was blood-brain barrier opening occurring by using imaging. And that's very important because blood-brain barrier opening with focused ultrasound is one of the areas that we can modulate, for example, to deliver drug. And by using imaging, you can see, ah, we deliver drug to the region that we hope to deliver drug to. And then the example on the right is different. This is an example of PET imaging, not magnetic resonance imaging, with molecularly targeted contrast agents to measure neuroinflammation. And the image on the right is a Parkinson's disease, disease, pa Parkinson's disease patient where there is a lot of neuro neuroinflammation detected by a PET radio tracer. And on the right is showing an example of a patient treated with a drug to decrease neuroinflammation. And you can see that imaging shows you the ability to monitor the effects of drugs in individual patients and individual brains. Okay, next slide, please. So my overall point is really one of convergence. Um, we, when we bring together neuroimaging scientists with neurologists or neuroscientists, we discover new imaging technologies. So why did MRI physicists develop diffusion tensor imaging for brain connectivity because they're working, with, they're working with neuroscientists who are explaining the importance of brain circuits and brain connectivity. And we say, oh, well, based on the physics, so we understand based on the physiology, you want to understand connectivity based on the physics of how water diffuses through, through constrained barriers, we can invent diffusion tensor MRI and, and actually image in vivo brain connectivity. So that's the kind of thing that we can do at UVA. We have, as if all the panels have talked about, these, this, this cross-grounds dialogue of physicists, engineers, neuroscientists, biologists, and in the field of neuroimmunology, I can almost guarantee, I can't guarantee invention, but one can almost guarantee that when we bring together the engineers and physicists with the people saying to image neuro, the neuroimmune system, that's gonna be important we can start to envision ways where the quantitative sciences, the engineers and physicists are going to say, ah, if we talk enough, we'll be able to invent methods to be able to image neuroimmunology. Well, thanks, Fred. As someone who's imaged the heart most of your life, uh, what gets you personally excited about merging these efforts of imaging and neuroimmunology? Yeah, it's this coming together of, of the imaging physicists and the engineers uh, understanding the underlying uh, physics of imaging systems and talking to the neuroimmunologists. In fact, Ayo and I are conceiving a project, perhaps, we have to talk further about you know, how to uh, 
probe the role of adenosine receptors in the brain with imaging. And so it's the dialogue and the coming together, the convergence of the different disciplines to really generate, people talk about discovery, but we also talk about invention, so inventing new imaging technologies. Well, speaking of, uh, you know, to exemplify just how powerful neuroimaging can be in a discovery project, I'm going to ask Akpom Ayo to uh, uh, show us, share some of his exciting science with us. Thank Ayo. you, Harry. So one of the, one of the uh, really powerful things about imaging that Fred has uh, communicated to us is the different scales at which we can do imaging. He's talked about doing imaging, especially in humans, but there's a lot of work that goes into some of the preclinical studies that we have to do in mice. And our lab especially focuses on using these approaches to image um, not only the brain generally, but actually cells specifically that are in the brain. And we use transgenic mice to do this. This is on the, on the left here, you can see an image of the approach that is called two-photon imaging, where we can take a, a mouse in this case, open up its skull, and put a high-powered microscope to be able to observe the cells that are present in there. This, the uh, image in the middle, uh, if it'll play, is it? Yeah, as you can see that, it's, we're going through the depth of the brain, and what you can appreciate are cells that are these immune cells that Taji mentioned called microglia, and we can see them through the depth of the tissue of the brain, as well as the vasculature in magenta as we go through the brain. So we can actually visualize these cells using these approaches. In the video on the right, what you can see as it plays is you can appreciate in the center what we have done, we've caused a little bit of injury to the brain. And these cells in the order of minutes can use some of their finger-like projections to respond really rapidly. And we have the imaging technologies to be able to observe that. And in future, we'll be talking about some of the potential application to some of these um, um, uh, approaches. We can therefore image not only depth of tissue in the brain, we can also image longitudinally, in this case of minutes, but we can even do long-term imaging, for example, in the case of different neurological diseases, over longer time scales of days, weeks, months, and even years. And this provides us the avenue to be able to start to study these issues in a preclinical setting that we hope can translate into the clinic as well. A little bit, quite literally, and to showcase the macroscopic scale of imaging, I'm going to ask James Stone on the panel, a radiologist, to tell us about capabilities in di diagnostic human neuroimaging and using imaging as an interventional tool. Th thanks, Harry, and, and thanks for the opportunity to be here and, and for everybody's attention. Um, Fred talked a short while ago about uh, PET imaging, um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that because PET imaging is, is a really important imaging threat as we consider opportunities with merging neuroimmunology and, and neuroimaging. PET's an important clinical imaging method that involves administering and then visualizing a radiopharmaceutical. Well, what's a radiopharmaceutical? A radiopharmaceutical is basically a compound that has uh, two components. It has a biologically active component that is specifically engineered to bind with molecular signatures within cells or tissues. So these may be sig signatures of disease, these may be signatures of normal development, but these are molecular signatures that this biologically active component is designed to be able to bind. And then tagged onto that, we have a visualization component, which is basically a small amount of a special form of low-level radiation that we can see with a PET scanner. Now, PET scanners are really, really effective at being able to pick up these tracers. So these tracers can be imaged at a femtomolar level, which is a really, really small level. And so it gives us the ability to be able to image at a macroscopic scale with a clinical imaging method to be able to image some of these important molecular level processes that are occurring that can tell us a whole lot about the specifics of disease or um, a, about normal development as well. Now, PET imaging has really taken off over the last few, few years because there have been more and more PET tracers that have become available that have been able to show us specific features of certain cancers, um, wh whether they're present, whether there's uh, the localization throughout the body, specific signatures of neurodegenerative diseases. We can even directly image inflammation. We can directly image the organisms that are responsible for inflammation. So there's been an entire expansion of our ability to be able to use this really powerful method to be able to image in humans, in a clinical setting, things that are important for us to understand diagnosis, prognosis, and therapy. Now, 
in addition to diagnosis, PET is also starting to take on more and more of a role in therapy itself. So by t using that low level amount of, of, of radiation that we can see with a PET scanner and putting that directly onto a therapy, we can see where that therapy is going, we can make sure it's getting to the place where it needs to go, and we can make sure that it's getting there in the uh, amounts that are necessary for it to be able to actually affect change. So in addition to PET, MRI is also starting to take on more and more of an import important role within therapy. And MRI is playing a really important role in anatomical guidance for non-invasive therapies. So one example of this is MR-guided radiotherapy, where MR is used in order to be able to direct a beam of radiation within tissues, primarily within the setting of, of, of a malignancy. MR is also being used for MR-guided focus ultrasound, which we heard a little bit about um, from Fred a little bit earlier. And uh, MR-guided focus ultrasound essentially involves using an MR uh, uh, scanner to be able to direct focused ultrasound energy into tissues. And that focused ultrasound energy, as it converges into a direct location within tissues, where that energy deposits, it has the ability to be able to change the tissue at that location. Now, historically, focus ultrasound has been used primarily for ablating tissues. So it's been really helpful in the setting of cancer. It's been really helpful in the setting of movement disorders, where it's, it's important to be able to disrupt certain circuits within the brain in order to be able to treat a movement disorder. But what we're learning more and more about is we can actually use focus ultrasound to modulate tissues. So we can modulate brain activity and we can modulate opening of the blood-brain barrier, which is extremely important, as we'll talk about a little bit later in the concept of possible immune-based therapies. So both PET and MRI have been transformative for diagnosis, but we're seeing more and more that both of these modal modalities in combination with therapies uh, can be extremely important for treatment as well. Well, James, let me put you on the spot as well. What do you see as the greatest opportunity in merging these two fields, neuroimaging and neuroimmunology? So I, I really see these fields as a continuum. So basic discovery is extremely important for peeling the layers of the onion back, for us to understand the ground truth of what's occurring within systems, what's occurring in normal development, what's occurring within disease, and to actually understand the mechanics of how things are occurring and what those molecular signatures are. We can build directly upon that critical basic discovery to bring our molecular level of imaging approaches and design targeted therapies that will allow us to be able to understand prognosis, understand appropriate matching to therapy, and to be able to actually see some of these, these, uh, uh, these treatments in action. So they really are, in my opinion, sort of part of a, an overall continuum um, that is part of a pipeline for translating discovery um, into therapy and being able to have um, the real impact on human life that I think all of us in this field strive for. Well, thank you. So your group has uh, broken your overall idea of harnessing uh, the immune system into two moonshots. And I'd like to dig a little further, a little bit into the first part, namely identifying and targeting, targeting common your immune pathways and disease. And for that, I'll ask Taji to walk us through the the ideas and the common features of neuroinflammation, please. Yes, thanks, Harry. So um, this idea centers around that there are very diverse neurological diseases, but there's some common emerging patterns that might be um, the points where we would want to intervene, treat, or understand more just in, instead of sort of targeting each individual disease differently, what are the common themes and what can we learn? So one common theme is that these cells that are in the brain, the microglia, which we all got to see, responds to injury in AO's exciting movie. Microglia for a long time have really been the cell type that has let us know that something's happening in the brain, that there's disease or some sort of insult to the brain that has occurred. Microglia change shape. They go from a very branched, ramified shape to a very um, condensed and what we call an amoeboid form, and this is the activated microglia. Activated microglia um, can be spurred by so many different insults, but basically they tell us that something's happening in the brain. And so why would this matter? So microglia activation, if there's um, too much microglia activation, that can actually cause damage to the brain, right? So this is one thing, if you have an overactive immune response, that can actually damage a tissue. And it's also been seen that microglia will actually remove some of the connections within the brain. And so this can be detrimental for sort of breaking down the circuitry that makes us who we are. 
But if you have underactive microglia, you can get the buildup of toxic debris, and you can also just get a generally unhealthy brain, as microglia are very much keepers of a healthy brain. So that's, that's sort of one theme. And so the other thing we are also can appreciate from AO's video, but also in the context of so many diseases, is that microglia will accumulate around an area of disease or insult within the brain. And so the example I'm showing you here are microglia responding to an Alzheimer's disease plaque. So when these microglia are responding, they do definitely change their uh, genetic, or their, so the genes that they're expressing, they take on this disease-associated um, pattern, so they're called DAM. And so essentially what we want to understand is, are there commonalities in the ways that these cells respond that can be targeted to treat disease? Can we come up and find signatures that are um, good for a healthy brain, promote healing, versus those that sort of tend to be detrimental to brain function. And similarly, another common thread amongst neurological diseases is a response to injury. So this happens in so many settings, including um, when you can have a stroke or a traumatic brain injury, spinal cord injury, infection, and it could keep going. When we, whenever there are little bits of damage to the brain, the way that the immune system responds, there seems to be commonalities to where an immune response is generated to that damage, but then there's a really interesting th thing that happens. So the immune system responds, it starts to develop, and then there seems to be an inflection point where either patients will go on to a good outcome or a poor outcome. So trying to understand what's regulating that, there's some, it could be a genetic, it could be environmental, we don't know what it is, but if we can understand this inflection point that sort of drives a good versus poor outcome, this might be the place where we need to intervene. And thinking about neuroimaging, one thing we absolutely want to do is be able to monitor patients and know where they are in this disease process so we can know when to intervene. James, maybe you can expand a little bit on that. How can your imaging help us understand these neuroimmune pathways? Absolutely. So, you know, Taj, you just talked to us about the importance of being able to find those common underlying threads um, across neurological diseases. Um, and that really is an important moonshot, uh, being able to find those fundamental threads. And I would put that at the level of discovering brain lymphatics. So, you know, certainly that is you know, something that's within, within the wheelhouse of the big um, to be able to, to really sort of strike at those important um, basic discoveries. And what we can do from an imaging perspective is once we have that information from basic discovery, we can build targeted imaging agents around that. So once we know what those specific signatures are of a good outcome or a poor outcome, we can start building specific molecular imaging probes and tracers that allow us to be able to image in the clinic, in the patient care setting, whether an individual with a given neurological disease is going to have a positive or negative outcome. That's incredibly important for understanding what the overall prognosis is in the setting of a given neurological disease. It's also really important for being able to match patients to the appropriate therapy. So once we actually understand the molecular signatures of their, the, um, on a neuroimmune level of their neurological disease, then we can ensure that we're matching them to future therapies that will be designed based upon that information as well. Well, let me bring Ayo back in the conversation. Ayo, what do you see in terms of discovery potential here? Yes, Harry, thanks for that. I think, I think the discovery potential here is really high. And that's why I myself, a couple, several years ago, um, decided to come here to UVA. So here at UVA, we have the opportunity, as has been mentioned in several of the panels before, to collaborate and work together. And I'd like to use an example from some of the work that we've recently done. So we just recently published a study that showed that these immune cells, the microglia, are actually critical and important in regulating the vascular tone in the brain. Well, that study was not able to be completed except with work that we did in our brain immunology and glia center in collaboration with Dr. Alex Kwan and also with the CDRC, the Cardiovascular Research Center, in collaboration with Dr. Brent Isaacson. So what has been mentioned several times so far in this, in this uh, in these series of panels is the ability for us at UVA to collaborate together and do some of this work. And I should mention, although it's not highlighted in the study itself, some of that collaboration was actually brought together by JDeep's uh, brain uh, epilepsy group meeting that facilitated the communication between our lab as well as Dr. Alex Kwan's lab. So the potential is high for that in the present, but we also have a history of these types of discoveries. 
we mentioned, for example, the lymphatics, uh, uh, work in the big center is going on that is actually discovering new drugs that are now being used to target COVID-19. So we have a history that shows that we can make these discoveries. We have connections and collaborations that allow these discoveries to happen. And if I can take one more quick minute, with due respect to those in our Muslim uh, community, I see and envision that UVA itself can become, if you will, the Mecca of neuroimmunology, and dare I say, maybe even the Mecca of neuroscience, <laughs> such that we can come and collaborate together with the new faculty that we get to recruit and the existing established faculty that are present here, I can see the imaging possibilities to be very, very high. Well, thank you, Hale. Uh, James, can you expand a little on the therapeutic opportunities that you see? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I think where our vision really is here is to start moving past simple disease-based diagnosis. So, you know, you have a, an illness and, you know, we'll you know, try therapy and then we'll see what the outcome of that therapy might be. We want to start moving more towards outcome um, and therapy-based diagnosis. So when we're getting the diagnostic information, we are simultaneously getting the level of information that's necessary for us to be able to actually say things at, at a fairly granular level about what we can expect for the natural course of, of this disease to be but also what's necessary in order to be able to either reverse or to be able to generally sort of uh, mitigate or, or slow the natural uh, course of that process. So I think, you know, bringing together neuroimmune discovery with bringing together, you know, trying to sort of move the needle past simple disease-based diagnosis is where the, the therapy potential is here. Thank you. Well, Taji, we have a second moonshot, namely overcoming barriers to brain entry for immune-based therapy. Could you please explain what you mean by that? Sure will. So I brought up earlier the presence of the blood-brain barrier. And maybe where people have heard about the blood-brain barrier before is you know, asking whether or not a drug would cross this barrier. So the blood-brain barrier is impermeant to most molecules. Um, it's, a, it's so essentially, um, this has always been an issue with treating brain disease, right? So we can come up with amazing therapies that typically treat disease in the rest of the body but really have little efficacy in the brain. And so some of the treatments that we're particularly excited about leveraging to treat neurological disease are some more new age biologics. And a couple examples are antibodies. And so I think we're all thinking about antibodies these days and whether or not our antibodies are protecting us from, from COVID. But um, antibodies are so highly engineerable. We can make them specific for so many different things. And so many um, biologics now are targeting um, elements of the immune system to reduce inflammation. They could also be used to tag the disease promoting uh, processes that are ongoing and we could clear them out of the brain. So antibodies have enormous potential for treating the brain, as do engineered immune cells. So there's a lot of exciting stuff going on in startup companies where they're essentially able to take immune cells and strip them of most of their functions, but make them do exactly what we need them to do in disease. And so the, one of the issues is that both of these technologies have been outstanding for changing the game in treatment of cancer. So immunotherapy of cancer has brought us so far recently in using both of these therapies, but they've largely failed in the brain. One of these reasons is that we can't get these biologics or these cells across the blood-brain barrier without intervention. So just for an example, you know, antibodies are 70, 76 times too large to just passively you know, move through the blood-brain barrier. And for scale, that's the difference between a human and a 15-story building. That's just an enormous difference in, in scale and the, the ability of these molecules to get into the brain. And T cells are 54,000 times too large. So essentially, we've got all of these new exciting treatments available, but we've got to make them work in the brain. Well, James, can you tell us how we get these exciting therapies across the blood-brain barrier into the brain? Absolutely. So just to talk a little bit more about focused ultrasound. Um, so we've alluded a couple of times during this panel presentation so far that focused ultrasound um, is a very important, very powerful um, therapeutic technique. Um, and again, historically, it's primarily been used for ablating tissues, but we're learning more and more how we can use focus ultrasound in a fashion that we um, use it to modulate tissues, specifically to modulate opening of the blood-brain barrier. So if you think about uh, the context where we can open the blood-brain barrier non-invasively, 
and then um, administer some of these agents, it opens up an entirely new frontier for being able to allow for immune-based therapies, which again, as Taji talked about earlier, have been spectacularly successful in other areas of the body by being able to um, modulate opening of the blood-brain barrier temporarily using focused ultrasound, it opens up an entirely new frontier for immune-based therapies for treating uh, a variety of different um, neurological disease. And if we can go to the next slide. And we can take things even a step further by using some of our, our pet-based technology to be able to label these therapies, so to be able to label cells, to be able to label antibodies, and to be able to directly image them going across the blood-brain barrier. Um, and this is uh, incredibly important because, you know, the way that we're currently opening the blood-brain barrier is primarily looking at acoustic feedback or looking at thermal feedback. And the best feedback that we can get is actually seeing whether that therapy is entering the brain whether it's going where we need it to go, and whether it's getting there within the concentrations that we need it, need, need it to go. So as a part of our moonshot, we have the opportunity here at UVA to be the first in the world to put together MR-guided focus ultrasound with PET, with the capability to be able to use some of these engineered um, uh, therapies, label these engineered therapies, uh, to be able to um, allow for immune-based therapies to really truly, for the first time, have a role in neurological diseases and to be able to see these therapies in action. Taji, are there any low-hanging grapes, if you will, immediate opportunities here at UVA? Uh, of course. Well, so just sort of thinking about um, how these therapies would uh, target specific diseases. I think that uh, treating brain tumors is, is the, sort of the obvious first, first place to go, um, just in the ability to, to have some idea of what to target. But it doesn't stop there. I think that as we have further understanding of so many disease processes, we could promote inflammation in settings like tumor where there's a weak response. We could shut down inflammation. Um, most of the MS drugs are all targeting the immune system to try to shut it down, but we typically do that outside of the brain. So we have these therapies that don't cross the blood-brain barrier that are highly efficacious. Thank you. Well, Fred, you've been here the longest, 21 years or so. Uh, where do you see uh, UVA's unique advantages in this space? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think there's really two areas that I think um, we can get, have an important role with imaging. Uh, so I think the first one is in marrying imaging to discovery biology and neuroimmunology. So as I sort of briefly talked earlier, we have a track record of, of inventing new imaging technology. And as we, as we understand the particular things that the neuroimmunologists want to image, we want to see inflammation better. We probably want to see you know, particular subtypes of inflammation. Uh, UVA will be able to, either in the area of PET uh, or in MRI, I think invent new imaging technologies that can see that and assist in discovery biology and that will also probably uh, translate to be useful in clinical imaging. And then secondly, uh, in terms of focused ultrasound use to deliver therapy, uh, we are well suited to either do work ourselves or to work in collaboration with industry uh, to build maybe the world's first system that brings together MRI, PET, and focus ultrasound all in one system to be able to actualize and achieve the kinds of um, studies and experiments that James was talking about. Well, thank you, Fred. I think we're at the end of our formal presentation. Uh, it's been a lot of fun to work with all of you, and I think we've really synthesized some interesting ideas, and uh, we have plenty of time for questions and comments from the audience. Yes. Wait a minute. We need to, the microphone. It's actually broadcast, and I'm going to repeat the question. Um, thank you. Um, so you guys are going to be, with imaging, collecting a lot of data, right? And that's going to inform treatment approaches for patients. But uh, in terms of long um, or big picture ideas, do you think that data collected from these sorts of studies could be used and analyzed in ways, you know, like machine learning or something that would 
improve predictive capacity over time? And what would that look like? Yeah, I can address that. So, can, uh, you, can you repeat, yeah, just the, question repeat the question? Or... The question is generally saying, um, probably around imaging and other areas, we're going to be generating a lot of data. And so the question is, do I think that, or do we think that machine learning or other data sciences will be important? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, I think that um, uh, Jack was, was really the champion on the prior panel of the role of data science. But, um, yeah, there is going to be, especially with imaging, there's going to be a tremendous amount of data that's, a, that's, that's acquired. Uh, and then whether it's with prediction, um, say for predicting, you know, what will be the, what will happen to a patient and how might a patient benefit from certain treatment or other. So prediction is one way. And then also uh, in the discovery biology part of things, uh, it, data science will also play an important role uh, there. If I could just add to that, um, you know, this is, imaging and data sciences is, is very important. Um, and it's an area that UVA has some specific and particular strengths in. You know, when we think about, you know, particularly from a, from a radiologist perspective and an imaging perspective, we use our own human visual system in order to be able to look at and interpret imaging when it's just a, a person, when it's just a human that's looking at that imaging. And our human visual system has evolved in a very specific way. So it's been very sort of threat um, associated. It's very, been very sort of object associated in, in the way that things have evolved. And so we're really, really good at picking up discrete things within imaging. We're not so good about picking up things that are more diffuse, more diffuse patterns in, in imaging. Well, it turns out computational systems are actually really good at that. So, you know, by looking at specific imaging features, and these feature layers may be thousands or tens of thousands of layers um, deep in terms of the way that, that computational systems can look at imaging, you can start mining um, different patterns, different ways of looking in, in, at imaging that are so far beyond what the human visual system are, is capable of. So you bring up a really important part that as we think about imaging in general, as we think about basic discovery in general, um, and we think about data sciences, the data sciences piece of this is critical, not just for the overall volume of data, but the way that computational systems can look at our imaging information in order to be able to extract patterns that are simply beyond human comprehension. So uh, John Lukens, Department of Neuroscience. Um, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about undergraduate involvement in, in your vision. And I'm just thinking, like, would, could you envision UVA being the first place in the country, in the world, where people could go and take neuroimmunology classes as an undergrad or neuroimaging classes, and that could be a concentration? It seems like that's, there's a real hunger for that out there. It would, be, it would be a cool opportunity. I know they're a very important part of the, the research mission, but I think there's, a, there's an academic opportunity um, to potentially you know, be the first to train the future, even starting out as an undergrad. Yeah, um, well, well, go ahead. Yeah, I'll sort of speak to that. It's been incredible to build the curriculum for the graduate students here. So when I started um, at UVA and the big center was formed, we didn't have any formal coursework in neuroimmunology. And then we now have a, a track within the, the graduate major mm -hmm. where people can focus on neuroimmunology. And I think that, we absolutely have intense interest from undergrads, and I think that being able to reach them, they're already part of our research mission, as you said, but I think that, yes, building coursework for them would be incredible. Yeah, within biomedical engineering, we already have an undergraduate elective on medical imaging, and we have two undergraduate electives just with, built within the past three or four years on data science. And the data science, um, have to, so, you know, in all transparency, the medical imaging elective isn't that popular. We get about 25 students per semester. Um, but the data science electives are becoming very popular these days. Just to add to John, and even to the last question, emphasize, in my opinion, what is very exciting about all of this is that here at UVA, we do have the infrastructure to get all this going. So it's very exciting um, that uh, whether with the data science type of things, you know, we have a base of that available already that we can build upon with the undergraduates. We have fantastic undergraduates here, and we have, uh, I would say, 
I have fantastic colleagues that uh, do a great job of teaching that we can develop this program. So we're in the right place, it's the right time. There's every reason why we should do that. And I, I, that's part of my dream, John, that UVA becomes the place you think about as a high school student, if you want to get into neuroimmunology, you come here. That would be very exciting to build. Yeah, and just one more comment on that. I think that the really sweet spot for undergraduate involvement, so I appreciate the question, it's a really good one. Um, probably the sweet spot for undergraduate involvement in this is kind of at the research in the individual lab space. So there's gonna be a lot of opportunity to do that. And that's, at least in our department, there's tremendous interest and involvement of undergrads in all kinds of, of research. And this would be, uh, I think, very well suited for that. Um, so it seems like a lot of neuroscience, basic science, depends upon imaging at the cellular level using microscopy or two photon, as you all have described. But in order to really bridge that gap between the basic science and the, the human imaging, there would need to be a lot more interest in animal imaging using MRI or PET scans. How important do you think this is as part of UVA's mission to bring this more into basic science and how well positioned do you think UVA is to make these advances? Yeah, I think it's really important. So um, a lot of the research I do is exactly in this sort of translational space in, in heart disease models. Um, but I have uh, I've been working in, in translational imaging, meaning sort of mouse to human you know, for about 21 years. And that is where, that's exactly where, so small animal mouse imaging is where a lot of the translation occurs from basic discovery to human imaging. Uh, and it often happens where, you know, sort of a new aspect of physiology is best understood in the basic lab. You then work on developing imaging technology in the mouse model. And, you know, in the times where that turns out to be new inventions are useful, then that can directly translate to human imaging. So I think it's quite important to, uh, and we don't really have that here too much, as f to my knowledge, maybe we do, but I'm not aware of it. We don't really have multiple investigators doing preclinical imaging and mouse models in the brain. We have some of it, but we could do a lot more of that. Yeah, and, and just to add to that, I mean, I, I think that that's a, that's a critical question that, that you bring up. And, um, y you know, um, uh, it's also really important when we're talking about developing these molecular level um, tracers. So just as an example, you know, some years ago we were working with a, a new tracer that labeled neut neutrophil inf infiltration. We were really interested in understanding that in the context of traumatic brain injury. And so, you know, we have a study that, you know, basically looks at immunohistochemistry for the certain, you know, um, markers that we're interested in looking at. Then we can go directly to tissue autoradiography with fluorescently labeled tracers, tissue um, uh, or uh, tissue scanning with fluorescently labeled tracers, tissue autoradiography using the same tracer, but then radioactivity, and then go right to the PET scanner. So I think we have, you know, um, some nice examples of, of how we do that, um, but, but the preclinical translational aspect of this is, is a very important stepping stone uh, be, between uh, basic discovery and, frankly, as a part of basic di discovery and then clinical translation. So, Harry, you didn't get to speak, so I'm going to ask you a question. Uh, I think one of the most exciting and early uh, translation of what everybody's been talking about is in glioma research, and I see BJ sitting in the back, and Jason Sheehan. Can you talk about how all these advances in imaging focused ultrasound and immunology can really put us at forefront of glioma research and treatment? Well, I think one of the more promising uh, agents for treatment is really CART T cells. They're engineered immune cells that can recognize foreign cells or epitopes on cancer cells specifically, but as Taji laid out so beautifully in her slide, these things are how many times too big for the blood-brain barrier? 54,000. 54,000 times too big for the blood-brain barrier. So you could infuse those and you could use focused ultrasound and actually only open the blood-brain barrier precisely at the tumor and around the tumor margin 
allow these cells to penetrate and go in and visualize them at the same time that your agent is actually getting where it needs to go. We know that these molecules work perfectly or almost perfectly in certain myeloid cancers uh, where, the, of course, we don't have that barrier in between, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity with engineered immune cells to deliver them to the brain. And I think brain cancer is an opportunity for very quick translation because these patients have no option. If you ask patients would they want to participate in the trial, we have nothing else to offer. They will readily participate, and that will then lay the groundwork for many other disorders in the central nervous system to treat accordingly. I might take the opportunity to put Rich Price on the spot. and. Uh... Because he's done some work, well, he's done a lot, he's, he's one of the leaders in opening the blood-brain barrier with focus ultrasound to deliver therapies, even gene therapies for, say, Parkinson's disease, for example. So, sorry, Rich. Thanks, Fred. No problem. <laughs> um, I, I, I guess the best way I can like, put this in context is actually share an anecdote that just happened in the, um, um, in the break. So I had never met Larry Lum before, who's, who's right here. Okay, I've, I've met him by Zoom. Um, a couple of times, and um, I know that he works on um, bispecific armed T cells, which are not CAR T cells, but they're similar to those. And um, we were introduced at the break, and Larry starts talking about this clinical trial that's showing great success. And wouldn't it be great to open the blood brain barrier with focused ultrasound, label the bat CAR T cells, or bat cells rather, with a PET tracer, which we've talked about here, and actually go ahead and um, do that particular clinical trial. So anyways, we've already designed the trial. We're all set to go. Um, we just need the support. So I probably should respond to that a little bit. Uh, it, um, it, we actually started about four years ago with uh, Camila Fadu, who is in neuro-oncology. And um, you know, we actually had this idea that um, uh, arm-targeted T cells using the bispecific antibodies directed at EGFR, which is a common antigen um, on uh, the gliomas. Uh, so we designed this trial, and actually uh, uh, there were many challenges. Let's put it that way. Uh, but we got it through, and uh, it, you know, it's an IND that I sponsor. Uh, uh, for the targeted T cells, which is a drug now that the FDA expects uh, uh, UVA will submit as part of their IND. And uh, we actually infused, uh, well, we tried to infuse 18, but we actually finished uh, the clinical trial. Um, the abstract just went off to a neuro-oncology meeting. And uh, so we got some encouraging results. Um, and the trial basically was, <clears throat> Uh, with primary glioblastoma patients. So starting up front before recurrence of disease, we basically obtained their lymphocytes, grew them in our CGMP facility, which UVA actually has a top of the line uh, facility that, you know, uh, uh, Rick Shannon went to, you know, as you all know, to the state and uh, helped guide the construction of this 7,500 uh, square foot facility with six GMP rooms, half of them negative pressure. So we're uh, very well positioned, okay, to actually manufacture antibodies, bispecific antibodies, CAR T cells, uh, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, other immune components um, to be combined, um, including you know, labeling with Zerk or India, or whatever pet tracer we would like uh, to manufacture a cell, and we're good to go. So anyway, to make the long story short about the glial uh, patients, um, the median overall survival was 31 months, which is a number that I think most of you know in neuro-oncology would knock your socks off. Now. The caveat is there are only nine patients that we went through the dose escalation. And we gave um, you know, anywhere from 45 billion, with a B, to 120 billion cells without putting anybody in ICU 
with cytokine storm, which is you know something that all the CAR T cell people are always worried about. So anyway, so encouraging results, uh, opportunity, um, as Rich is just suggesting, that we can combine forces here. We actually can leverage our ability to grow cells, uh, the INDs that we have, uh, and the clinical protocols that already exist. Um, so to go forward in the next step, actually uh, leveraging this technology is really, uh, I, want, I, I don't want to quite say no-brainer, but uh, it's a, a golden opportunity. Thank you for sharing that. That was great. Uh, this is Aminata Kulibali in neurology again. Um, I, throughout all the panels today, we've heard about the impact that all of the research would have on the community in Charlottesville and in an advancement of science. Um, being associated with the Big Center, I know that a lot of the work that we do also looks at the effect of peripheral immunity on the brain itself. So can you guys speak to the global impact that this type of moonshot idea, moonshot idea especially in terms of neuroimmunology, would have in understanding not just um, neurological issues we have in the U.S., but in less known area like the Amazons or Africa, for example. Absolutely. So, you know, I think that there are so many neurological diseases that in the United States are far less prevalent than there are around the world. A lot of them are related to infectious disease. And so what we know about infectious disease is that you can get either side of the coin, once again, you can get too active of an immune response or an underactive response that sort of predisposes the brain to being attacked by the pathogen. But um, yeah, so I think that the incredible thing about all of the basic science that'll go on is that it will basically be laying the foundation for just the understanding of how all of this happened, how, how these processes happen normally and then how they go wrong and how we can promote them. And I think that so much of what we would be finding would be, so that's why we really wanted to focus on these commonalities because I think as we're studying all of these diseases, the recruitment of immune cells, these peripheral immune cells to the brain is a feature of so many diseases. And in some we want to prevent it and some we want to promote it. So I think that we will have a greater understanding of a lot of disease processes um, and so then the potential that they'll be able to be applied to so many diseases, I think, is higher because we're looking for these common threads. Your point is a good one. The leading cause of epilepsy globally is a viral infection, 1.5 million patients a year. Not a big problem in the United States, but globally it is. And understanding that and finding treatments will really have a, have a tremendous impact. BJ? Okay, thanks. I'm honored to be last. Hi, BJ Piero, Neuro-Oncology. Um, firstly, great presentations and really exciting stuff. Um, just want to touch on a couple things quickly um, with a little bit of time we have left. Um, just want to touch on focus ultrasound fuss a little bit. Super exciting area where UVA already has strength. You know, Rich uh, was talking about great stuff. Natasha next to him, a rising star. Um, one of the cool things I think with respect to fuss and, and potential for brain tumors and other areas is that it can do different things. We've kind of focused on just opening the BBB, but I think some of the other uh, modalities are also super exciting and some of the other things FUS can do. It's more like a, you know, a Swiss Army knife than, than a screwdriver, I would say. And, you know, it, um, I think getting back to the original destructive potential, super exciting and I think will be very interesting uh, from an immunotherapy perspective, not necessarily with sort of heat killing, but maybe with the histotripsy destruction of tissues. I think that'll be a great thing to combine with things like um, checkpoint inhibitor antibodies, for example. Um, and, you know, there'll be things we'll need to work out, such as sequences, et cetera. But also the potential, and, and Rich and others have published on this, but um, <clears throat> um, the potential of FUS to boost gene therapies, for example, um, which is also really, I think, kind of amazing uh, that, that you can sort of locally really boost your delivery of a given gene, and I think this can dovetail well with certain immunotherapies that are gene therapy-based or just other gene therapies that, that can be exciting as well. Second thing I wanted to get into was, um, you know, uh, Taji and others have said a lot of um, 
great stuff about microglia. I would just throw down sort of a, a mini challenge within these grand challenges, but I think we could, you know, there's such great strength here and expertise, you know, with Taji with you, AO, everything you're doing and others. Um, I think we could focus on controlling, manipulating the microglia. I think we have existing drugs now. You know, I see some of this from the cancer side of things. Um, and there were drugs out there that people are really not paying attention to. And I think in terms of you know, return on investment and getting ahead of other fields, I see just little bits here and there. Someone will publish on this drug or that drug and they'll say, oh, we can get the macrophages to eat the cancer cells, for example, and really boost phagocytosis. But no one, for example, is extrapolating to microglia. So, you know, I, I believe so much in this, I'm really moving my lab into this area and trying to build a panel of drugs. And I think if we, as a group, sort of took the, the existing drugs, some of which are already in the clinic, you know, some of which are uh, in the pipeline, but readily available, and just figure out, uh, compare and contrast the different things they do to microglia, combine them in productive ways. No one is touching this, I, I believe. Um, and, you know, doing, and just really figuring out what happens with them. And then that's an actionable node where we can, with, with, with just a finite amount of investment, not that much, really have, I think, dramatic impact on a host of diseases, whether it's, you know, certainly neuro-oncology, and, you know, that's where we're focused, but I'm also trying to talk to people about things like in autism, let's trim, you know, the extra neurites you see in autism by, you know, revving up the microglia in the appropriate ways. You know, I've heard AO talk about how microglia are often viewed as like the bad guys in various diseases, and we can really make them into the good guys. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly for dementia, other diseases, I think we can do so much, even with existing drugs that we have, that people are just not paying enough attention to. So. Thank you, uh, sorry, BJ. Thank you. Can, can I just comment on that briefly? So, I right, totally agree, BJ. And I think that that you, know, you talked about the part, the comments you made about focus ultrasound being broader than opening the blood-brain barrier for drug delivery. I think we all entirely agree with that. It's also one of the reasons why it's a good uh, topic for this grand challenge, because it's there could be an investment made in infrastructure that's hard to get other ways. And so, you know, sort of new state-of-the-art, better image-guided focus ultrasound would not only facilitate the kind of studies that the panel talked about, but then all the ones that you were also talking about. Well, so. thank you. Uh, we're out of time, so a little over time, actually. So thank you to all the panel members. Thank you.